a journey you're into. All right, so we are going to get the stream up and going, and then we will commence. I believe that we are live. live? Yeah. Oh, it just works now. That's fantastic. Before <laughs> I had to click a button, and oftentimes I didn't do it. So I'm Stephen, and I'm Beth. And this is a Veni Vini Amici production. And so what we do is we ship out wine to people who order it, um, and then we plan it months in advance, and then we get together and we talk about the specific wines. Um, the regions, history, geography, language, culture. We like to talk about all kinds of topics related to wine. And the bottle is an example of the tasting, but if you don't have the bottle, um, any bottle from the region or any bottle you have, um, join us and and celebrate wine for all of the myriad things that it brings to, to the world. Exactly, because this is really just almost a catalyst, if you will, into the conversation of the of the specific regions and climates. And it's a, it's a great way to gather and connect on Zoom. The level that we speak at is somewhere around the W set two to three, if you're going for those types of certificates. Um, this lecture is going to be a little bit longer than normal because it is to Bordeaux, France. And there's a lot to touch on in this topic. We'll try to keep certain sections as brief as as we can, um, but at least let you know about um, you know the important factors of Bordeaux. Our lecture this evening is going to take us um, you know identifying where we're going on the map, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the history, and then terroir, the earth, the the climate, the 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 factors that impact the region. We're going to talk a little bit about the grapes that grow there and how that might be changing in the near future. And then we're going to talk about the, the classification system. And don't worry, it's really just going to be touching. So that way you know what the classification systems are. So if you are studying or interested in trying to dissect what is on this bottle of wine that you're looking at, um, you'll, you'll understand a little bit about these words crew and, and the different classifications. We're going to end with a tasting of the specific wine that is a Merlot dominant Bordeaux blend. And at the very end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about our tips and tricks to finding quality wine at that affordable price point, that 15 to $25 price point um, for Bordeaux. Of course, Bordeaux can match whatever you're willing to, to throw at it in terms of uh, pricing, uh, but how can you find the best wine for the money that you're willing to spend? Absolutely, so let's dive in. Bordeaux. All right. It is a famous region. The word Bordeaux just evokes history and legacy and expense. <laughs> <laughs> that it does. And we are coming from last month's lecture where we were in Napa, California. That AVA that is so synonymous with Cabernet Sauvignon. And we're looking at this latitude change between 36.7 north to 44.8 north and now you might be thinking like well but aren't they don't they grow the same types of grape varietals and that's a pretty big change in the latitude difference and one of the things that we're gonna talk about real quick is that napa if you remember we talked about the mountain ranges and its close proximity to the pacific ocean and so that pacific ocean was has really cool winds that come off of it in the mountain range protects it and we get really kind of year to year the vintages are very regulated by the mountain ranges and that pacific ocean the the way they play together produces predictability um, yes of course there is some variability between vintage to vintage um, but for the most part the vineyards in that valley are insulated now when we go north and we're in bordeaux north on those latitude lines Right? We have a little bit less sunlight, but we also don't have those mountain ranges where Bordeaux can be protected from the Atlantic Ocean, the Bay of Biscay, um, right to its east, or to its west, I'm so sorry. Um, and what we have is a, a region that has such rich history, but is so at the mercy of Mother Nature. And so we're, we're, we packed our bags and we're headed to 44.8 north latitude line to Bordeaux. Yes, so Bordeaux is located roughly equidistant from the equator and the Arctic Pole. Um, so that's where, again, 44.8. So, and as Stephen mentioned, it's very influenced by water, just like Napa, but without the 
mountain range to protect it. So while Napa Valley experiences a Mediterranean climate for a variety of reasons, Bordeaux is a different kind of climate entirely. It is definitely more of a maritime climate. So water is a huge influence here. You have wet, um, warmer summers. Um, you have a fair bit of rainfall. It can be quite humid. And you have a large number of bodies of water to take into consideration. So we have the influences of the Atlantic, and then we're looking at two rivers, the Dordogne and the Garonne rivers, and they join north of the city of Bordeaux to become the Gironde estuary. Throughout the region, we also have a variety of streams and smaller tributaries. So water is a big factor here. We also have relatively rolling hills, but, but relatively flat compared to some regions. Many wine growing regions are at the foothills of mountains and can experience quite steep slopes or elevations. Here, here are much more gentle rolling. However, the plots that are able to experience drain, proper drainage become key. So drainage here is everything. Um, the vines need to struggle. They don't need to be soaked in water. And so the best plots consistently tend to be those with good drainage, which interesting is when they do studies and when you do tastings, um, there's very different soils on the left and the right bank. So we'll get into that. I guess we'll do an overview right now. So the left bank is famous for its gravel soils and its Cabernet Sauvignon dominant. The right bank is famous for more clay soils, which can be mixed with some limestone, and those are Merlot dominant. And despite the fact that these soils are different, drainage again, the sites of the best drainage tend to be the most valuable. Um, there's a couple other geographical factors that we can mention here, um, but one of the biggest ones is also that they have a um, man-made forest called Les Landes, which is um, southwest of the region. Um, and it was planted specifically to help shield Bordeaux from the influences, the salty breezes from the Atlantic. And it does help with that a lot. Fascinating. We are drinking a wine from the right bank this evening if you purchased the um, Chateau Fleur Haute-Gosson. Um, and I have a little star here that you can see. Um, the purple are some of the most famous regions on the right bank, and we are west of Fronsac. Um, but we are in the heart of the right bank. Okay, there's a lot of words here, but don't worry, I'll go quickly. <laughs> I wanted to provide some history of the region because it, it, it does have a very long history of, of wine growing. Um, under Roman occupation is really when um, grapes for winemaking production began. Um, an important next date would be 1152, which is the marriage of Henry and Eleanor, which put the region under British rule. This is significant because at that time, a lot of Bordeaux wines were then exported to England and England and the UK continues to be one of the greatest purchasers of Bordeaux. And it really harkens back all the way to this event. Um, in the 1650s, the Dutch drained the Medoc. What does that mean? It means that until then, um, the left bank was actually a swamp and there was no grape growing there at all. But the Dutch are, are famous for um, managing water and they drained this region and its gravelly soils have been planted with um, grapes since and creating some of the most expensive wines in the world, really. Um, in the late 1700s is when Cabernet Sauvignon came along. Cabernet Sauvignon is um, the child of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. And basically, before the late 1700s, this grape didn't exist. So now it is one of the most famous grapes of all time. But it's actually a relative newcomer compared to some of the others. Um, in 1855 was one of the first classifications. And as Stephen mentioned, we'll give a brief overview of the classifications later. But this was famous because it was the first. And um, all of these cause controversy to this day. Um, and finally, um, there were two major events that allowed major replanting in the Bordeaux region. The first was the phylloxera epidemic. Um, phylloxera is a root louse that comes from North America and it um, kills Venus vinifera. Um, but um, they were eventually able to figure out that you could plant on American rootstock, um, and graft onto American rootstock, and you were able to continue to plant Venus vinifera that way. So they were able to do replanting then, and also in 1956, there was a devastating frost, which really reduced um, plantings. A lot of plants died and they were able to replant. And at this time was when a lot of Malbec 
was out and more Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon was in. And when we talk about Floxfra and all of these different lectures, you know, people who attend month after month are like, they're always talking about this Floxfra, right? The timing is different, right? It attacks different parts of the world at different times. And so that's why we still keep putting the dates on there. So, you know, 1857 to 1892 is when the devastation started. And then it, it grows as the, the Laos uh, multiply. And then you have basically the full replanting. And then they're considered completely out of it by 1892. Yeah, I mean, what happened was actually there was incredible diversity in Europe before this happened. And a lot more... Um, single varietal plantings occurred afterward, and that's kind of where we are to this day. So while we do have a number of grape varieties that grow in Bordeaux, which we'll talk about in a moment, there were many, many more before this epidemic, and we just the, the trend went a different way. Um, after such an epidemic, they wanted to plant the strongest, tastiest grapes possible, so they really went to a couple of varietals for that purpose. Ooh. And they still do that to this day. Yeah. Foreshadowing. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, there's left bank, famous for gravel soils, um, and right bank is famous for clay soils. Um, some differences about these soils. Gravel soils typically are going to be warmer and have better drainage. This is good for Cabernet Sauvignon because it likes to get warm in order to fully ripen. And you want fully ripe grapes to create um, delicious wine. Uh, Merlot prefers the clay soils because it stays a little cooler. It does get a little more water, but it doesn't like getting as hot as Cabernet Sauvignon. So it typically um, prefers the clay soils, and those are located primarily on the right bank. Yay. Here's some pictures from Pomerol, one of the very famous subregions of Bordeaux on the right bank. On the left, you can see some blue clay, and on the right, you can see some iron rich. Um, clay and uh, these factors contribute to the to the success of the winemaking. And so I think this is a great time for those who are tuning in after the event live. Well, you'll have to tune into this other event. But this Saturday, we are going to be tuning in um, to Catena Zapata with Wine for Normal People is having a discussion on um, terroir and that it is a real thing. Catena Zapata is down in Argentina and they've been working on a multi-year study and um, have been published in Nature for their technical paper about the existence of terroir. They prove that it exists. And so when you see these different soils, the roots go down and they're extracting the nutrients from the soil itself. And so on our right picture, when we have iron, it's going to have more minerality that is extracted into the roots. And that provides the energy that is then transferred um, to the grapes themselves. And so uh, tune in with us if you're interested. We'll drop a, a free link. Lecture. It's a free lecture. We'll drop a link in the chat. So moving on. So there are a number of grape varieties that grow in Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a region of blends most of all. So we have red blends and white blends. Our primary grapes that you're going to see the most plantings of are Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc in the reds. And in the whites, you'll see Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, and Muscadel. However, there are additional grapes listed on the slide that are also um, included and are less popular. Their plantings are much, much less significant. So one thing to talk about with the grape varietals, right? Like why don't they just plant all Cabernet Sauvignon or all Merlot, right? Well, and the reason is, is because they don't they have the variability of vintages right the what is mother nature giving them and so in certain years the merlot may thrive and then they don't really need the cabernet sauvignon or the petite verdot to provide oomph and body and ageability right they can just rely on that really rich merlot that reached full ripeness but if the merlot can't reach full ripeness and so it might be like a thin wine or it won't be as interesting or complex they can use some of these grapes that maybe bud later so that if there was an early frost, right, they avoided that early frost because they have a grape varietal that, you know, had bud break that was later in the season. Or maybe they have something that ripens earlier, right? So that way they've already pulled in all of uh, the vine, uh, all of the grapes that they need for a certain varietal before the hailstorms come in or before, for, uh, you know, uh, some type of uh, rain maybe um, comes in and, and dampens the crops. And so the variety of, of grapes allows for flexibility from vintage to vintage. 
It also can be very helpful in terms of harvest because Merlot will be harvested first, Cabernet Sauvignon will be harvested later. So from a practical standpoint, it allows the uh, winemaker to be working with wine at, and pick, having the picking happen at a different time and already start working with one of them instead of having to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. On this slide, we show um, percentages of planting. So Merlot is by far the dominant red planting in Bordeaux at 66%. Next is Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and then we have the remaining is really just 2% of plantings. On the white side, Sauvignon is 45, Sauvignon Blanc is about 43, and then Muscadel is 5, 7% other. Um, this is interesting because Cabernet Sauvignon, I think, is, is the varietal that a, a lot of people get very, very excited about. But it's important to note that Merlot is a huge factor in Bordeaux wine, 66% of plantings. So. And one thing to note is that as climate change has affected the farmers that are growing their plots, they're actually pulling up some of their Merlot rootstocks or the, their, their Merlot plants and replanting with Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. Um, Cabernet Franc is a little bit more resilient to the moisture as well as the heat from the maritime. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the maritime climate. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when we were talking about the maritime climate, for those of us that are in the Mid Atlantic region, we're very familiar with the maritime climate um, and that humidity and the heat that we have in the summer. And it's no surprise that we have already a lot of planting of Cabernet Franc in the Mid Atlantic region, specifically in Virginia. Um, and Bordeaux is starting to transfer into that as well in order to um, prepare for climate change. You know, the other way that they're preparing for that is to allow other grape varietals to come in. Now, I'm not going to go through grid by grid. Um, this is kind of for you guys to look at, but I'm going to touch some of the, the high points here. Um, on the right, we have, well, why did they um, plant these? The left is, is the grape varietal itself. So the Tariga Nacional coming from Spain, um, the reason that they did it was it has uh, natural resistance to, to, to disease, um, but the end result is that it's a black fruit, has wonderful color, high tannins, full body, and ageability. And so one, when they're replanting, they want a grape that is resistant to the predictable uh, mildews and diseases, as well as the uh, temperature and climate that's going to be in the region, but then also has this je ne sais quoi factor when they blend it all together. The, the fruits, the body, the ageability, and stuff that they can blend together to produce really great wines in the cellar. And that's one of the big things about Bordeaux is that they have always had a lot of talent come into the regions. Um, and so they can have the grace, uh, you know, good wines and grapes in the field and then produce great wines from the cellar. And so we have two crosses here, and then this Castets I thought was really interesting. So it's a, it's a varietal that was almost forgotten. Really nobody's planting it or in any great amount in, in the whole world, but they're allowing it to come back um, as a, a loud varietal. And so you might be thinking, well, what happens if somebody were to grow a different varietal and, and, and blend it into the Bordeaux wine. And it comes into the classifications. The classifications is going to restrict what type of grapes you can have in your um, end wine. And if you have grape varietals that aren't permitted or are in too high of a content amount, um, then that you won't be able to put Bordeaux on mm -hmm. the label itself. And so, you know, these are really big moves that have to happen on a, on a government level in order to allow the farmers to be able to plant the wines that can adapt to climate change. So that way, in the cellar, they can produce wine that has ageability, full body, wonderful acid structure, um, and wonderful wine. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So very brief overview of the classifications. So there are five major classifications um, present in Bordeaux that you may or may not hear about at some point. What's very interesting about these is you really won't see them on the label. So unfortunately, um, in terms of from a buyer's perspective, um, there's some terminology you'll need to know to know that you're working with those or you'll need to be in the know that those particular wineries are in that classification. Um, but the 1855 classification was the first one and it's I'll talk a little bit about that one and go over the others very, very briefly. But the 1855 classification was requested by Napoleon III in preparation for the World's Fair that was to be in Paris. 
and he requested that a classification be done. And the winemakers in the region were quite flummoxed and I think didn't really readily participate, but the um, e economy bureau there in Bordeaux decided to go ahead and, and deliver. And they basically decided that the only way that they could rank things was by the cost of the bottle. Now, this is a classification that has not been reviewed since 1855. There have only been two changes and one of them required someone who lobbied heavily for a decade to get moved from second growth to first growth. But this is, it is a system that is organized from one to five growths based on price in 1855. So you want to take some of this with a grain of salt. The other thing about the classifications is important to note is that some people are in multiple classifications and many classifications have become confusingly irrelevant when a third growth is the most expensive as opposed to the first growth. So Keep all that in mind. Um, the other thing is that a lot of these classifications are for the left bank. The only one that actually is for the right bank is Saint Emilion. Pomerol and Saint Emilion are the two most famous subregions of the right bank of Bordeaux, and Pomerol has no classification. So it can be a bit confusing, but um, if you're not in the business of collecting Bordeaux, it might not be too, too important in deciding whether or not you like it or not. I think a lot of these are um, incredible wineries. The Chateau that are in these classifications, they make incredible wine with incredible ageability. But whether or not they're a first growth or a third growth, you know, that, that may or may not be incredibly important to you drinking the wine. You know, I think that's a really great point that you made there about um, it might not be important to you. When you, when you. If you were to open up a wine textbook and read about Bordeaux, most of it's about this classification system, but for the average consumer whose price point is not in the hundreds of dollars for a typical bottle, they're not you know, trying to create these massive sellers for an investment type of situation. They're not in the talk about futures. Um, it's, it, is kind of, it feels a little irrelevant. Um, and so not to, not to say that they're not important, but for us and our, and our trying to find delicious, tasty bottles, um, we kind of just skip over it a little bit. And we look at pretty pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we mentioned that Bordeaux is a region of blends. And we mentioned that there's a variety of red and white grapes that come in, that grow in Bordeaux. Um, there are four major categories of wine that you can look out from this re look out for from this region. Um, we have a right bank, Merlot dominant, dry red, which is ironically put on the left of the picture and circled. That's what we're drinking this evening. We also have a left bank Cabernet Sauvignon dominant dry red that's shown on the upper right. We have a dry white, um, which can be a blend of Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon and Muscadel. And we also have some of the world's most incredible dessert wine, a sweet white, um, one of the most famous reasons you, you may or may not have heard of, so turn um, is one of them. They have there's a there's a couple of other regions to keep in mind, but that's you know I think one of the the names that is is, is most commonly known. And um, there's a little bit of a fun tasting challenge we have for you Ooh. with so turn. So. Um, so turns are frequently sold in demi bottles, so you're not obligated to consume an entire bottle of dessert wine because they are delightfully sweet with incredibly high acidity to balance, and they're just these amazing wines. But a little goes a long way. They pair wonderfully with dessert, and your tasting challenge is to go try this with one or two of Bordeaux's regional desserts. Now, I didn't know this before I studied for this lecture, but two famous French desserts come from Bordeaux. The first is the macaron, and the second is the cannelle. And the cannelle is, um, has a fun story behind it. Right, so when you're producing wine and you're in the cellar um, to fine and thin, and that's to get all the sediment and the, sometimes a lot of people think a lot of the flavor, like some of the phenolics come out with this, but it makes a very clean, clear looking wine, like what we're drinking this evening. And, likely what everybody who's tuning into this is drinking. Most pr common practice nowadays is to fine and thin. Now, a thinning agent, a natural thinning agent is egg whites, and it will agglomerate together, and then you could scoop it out, and then you get all the sediment out with the, with the agglomeration. 
But when you ha use all the egg whites, you have a lot of egg yolk. So legend has it that the cannelle is created because of this. So lots of egg yolk, they created custards, and supposedly a nun overcooked her custard one time and got nice little crispy bits on the outside, and thus the cannelle was born. <laughs> so if you see any of those at your local bakery, grab one, grab a bottle of Sauternes and give it a try. It'll be an amazing pairing. Because <laughs> what grows together... Goes together. I've heard that. I've heard that numerous times. <laughs> All right, everybody. So this is a wonderful video that was put together by our producer um, for our enjoyment. And so... We're just gonna Listen to how hotel are. Let it express itself. To each generation, we learn to know it. Respect it and shape it for each vintage writes its own story. My vineyard nestled in the earth of Hamlet watches over my vines growing on exceptional lands to draw all is well from it. Grapes delicately vinified to express the power of my terroir. In my cellars, I am perfect match between tradition and modernism. My wines have been designed to live and evolve without the years changing their character. Fineness, elegance are permanent features of my identity. A subtle balance between aromatic richness and powerful tannins. I have at my service a passionate and resourceful team who brings me every day its know-how, its skills to make me shine on the greatest tables and in many countries of the world. I continue on my way every year combining quality and consistency. A little out of the ordinary, I am one of the less Bordeaux superior wines to introduce myself as a wine to lay down, like the Grand Cru. Full of personality, I am Chateau Fleur Augustins. All right. <laughs> so that was a, a very... If that didn't make you want to drink the wine, I don't know what will. <laughs> but it's always wonderful to see images from the vineyards. We hope you enjoyed getting to see the, the vines themselves. And the people who brought that wine to you this evening. Um, you know, one of the things to talk about, we have down here the, the vintage year and the, and the blend that they used. In the video, our narrator, I'm not quite sure what perspective, if it was the land or the finished bottle or the specific grape, it seemed like it might have changed a little bit. But anyways, our narrator talked about how um, they try to capture each vintage year to the best of their ability, but then also create consistency of, of quality as well as what they can present um, from their land. Um, they, they have a goal that they're shooting for, um, and so they do blend a little bit. So we have some Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon, Malbec in here um, to really create that full experience and expression of the wine. Often blending small amount of um, some of the supporting grapes into your primary grape can improve the wine. A single varietal, um, while it might be lovely, with just a little bit of an addition can become really great. Um, and so one of the things we look for is 
um, obviously aromatics. So that way your approach to the wine when you first get that smell, what is coming out of the glass um, is, is really impacted sometimes at these very low amounts. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously the body structure, the acid, the tannins. Color. And color. Yeah. Exactly. So the 2016 vintage. Now I've been saying the 2015 vintage for Bordeaux <laughs> is amazing. And upon further review, it still is an amazing vintage for the big houses. And there are a lot of houses that were able to cap, uh, capitalize on the 2015 vintage. But the 2016 vintage, although it may not be as amazing as some sites were able to get in 2015, the 2016, just across the region, was a very easy vintage. And so when we're looking for quality wines that are at an affordable price point, I like to look for good vintage years because that means that um, people that are trained in the cellars and in the fields are able to capitalize um, on Mother Nature. And there's a little bit more wiggle room for um, inefficiencies. Maybe there's uh, labor issues and they, they need to wait a day. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things at play when the grapes are being harvested uh, that you want a good vintage year so that way you can wait a day or two and it's not going to destroy your crop. Yes, and Ooh. sometimes you don't have time to do a lot of research, say, on a producer. And in a, in a lesser year, you might want to really double check on who's making the wine. In a really great year, you can be a little more confident buying sight, you know, taste, sight untasted. <laughs> exactly, and that's a great point. It does not mean that because a vintage is bad, does not mean that all of the wines are bad. It just means that in like bad years, um, as people will claim some vintages to be, you would have to do your homework in order to determine whether or not the wine that you're about to purchase is going to be worth the money that you're paying for it. And so we look for these good vintage years. So in the situation that you're at a restaurant and you don't have time to Google search the entire <laughs> wine list, we have these kind of go-tos, if you will. So Bordeaux 2016, um, well, maybe that'll be a good pick, right? Yeah, absolutely. All yeah. right. I've, I skipped over this slide. It's the typical tasting notes that um, our Wine Access presented, um, as well as what Wine Folly says that we can typically pick up. Um, you know, this wine, I think, does have the, the dried herb notes to it, which was absolutely lovely. Oh, yeah. I get. Uh, I think one note I heard specifically, too, is bay leaf. And once I heard it, I couldn't unthink it when I smell it. So, yes, I, let, I get a lot of herbs. I get a nice earthiness to this exactly. wine it's really lovely paired really well with a variety of foods that we tried it with we have tried a lot of variety of foods all the way from some pork dishes which we don't typically eat um as well as some chicken pot pie it was wonderful mm -hmm. um i do like the the a little bit of dare i say graphite and i'm not sure if it's because i saw it up there but there is this mm -hmm. type of minerality note to it that i think is is wonderful oh yeah mm -hmm. Um, and so exploring wine, it's fine. We can leave it there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, it's team. Fine. Sorry, team. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our Chateau that we're drinking this evening and we put Pomerol and Saint-Emilion to remind you of the two famous regions on the right bank. We also have our rivers here just so that way you can see them spelled out. Um, in the middle between them, we have the entre du mer and then on the left, we have obviously our left bank. So. In the right bank, when you see Pomerol and Saint Emilion, and you're in that price point of fifteen to twenty-five dollars, for me personally, if I were to see a Pomerol, a Saint Emilion in that price point, that is a red flag to me. That doesn't scream this is a good deal because those wines are going to be properly marketed, so that way they can get the best amount for their their money. So that means that somebody has de you know decided not to do that so the region that we're drinking this evening is um is outside of those regions and that to me is is kind of a good thing um we also have <laughs> we also have the 2016 vintage which we talked about was universally good for the region of bordeaux and we also see on our label that it's above 2.5 abv and what that means is that the grapes have reached full maturity. 
when we're going through and if you are at a restaurant, chances are that ABV will be above 2.5%. Um, if it were under that, it probably didn't get exported. It's going to be more if you're in the region itself. Um, because there is a lot of money that is required to ship things across the United States and then distributors to take on a, a wine in order to, to sell it to you as the mm -hmm. consumer. And they just wouldn't do that. Yes, and um, we'll also talk a little bit about what Bordeaux Superior means, um, mm -hmm. which as alcohol content is, is one of the factors. So um, some appellations that you might see, so this is um, controlled regions um, coming out of France. It's a quality designation that allows you to know that you're drinking a quality wine that has a variety of requirements. Uh, Bordeaux AOC, so Appellation Controle, and Bordeaux Superior are two that you might see. Um, there's also 50, more than 50 named appellations. So you, um, beyond just Bordeaux, like we mentioned, Pomerol, saint Emilion, you might see names like this. Um, this includes whites, reds, sparkling wines, all kinds of different wines. But Superior is a great term to look out for, and tonight we're drinking a Bordeaux Superior. And that's because it has a higher standard. And that includes things like minimum alcohol content because that relates to ripeness and also sometimes residual sugar. There's aging requirements, um, yield requirements, and ripeness requirements. So all of that um, is controlled in order to create a higher quality wine. And so um, it only will appear on dry reds or sweet whites, but it's a great term to look out for when you're looking for a quality wine to I'll pick up and bring home. And the biggest, um, another thing to kind of uh, identify is that typically the price point between a Bordeaux AOC and a Bordeaux Superior from an appellation that isn't Pomerol or Saint Emilion is not going to be, uh, not going to break the bank. It's not going to be um, that big of a difference, and it is worth the money to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the 2016 vintage. Superior, which means that it's 12 months, but also the ABV will be above the 12.5. Um, I put cru equals growth because sometimes it's not a it's not a regulated term um, for the right bank mm -hmm. in a lot of the regions. So they'll throw cru on there or cuvee or, you know, these terms aren't necessarily regulated. Um, and so you as the consumer kind of when I see that, I take a step back and just, mm. okay, maybe I should do a little bit of research. Are they just trying to market to me? Because if somebody's marketing to me, then that means that they've invested some money and some thought into trying to get me as the consumer to purchase it, um, as opposed to maybe putting that effort into the wine itself. And so that's where we have these kind of heuristics, if you will. Yes, because the term Grand Cru Classé or Cru Classé are used in some of the very famous classifications. So sometimes on labels, they will put the word Cru to evoke the same level of um, Prestige. Prestige, but they are not technically part of any of those classifications. One last term you can look for also is Grand Vin de Bordeaux, and this will appear on a winery's label when it is their premier wine. So many wineries, for economic reasons, will have tiers of wine that they produce, and they can actually be under different labels, but they will put Grand Vin de Bordeaux on their highest level of wine that they produce. So when you see that, what that means is that that's that chateau's best that they are, are selling. Mm -hmm. um, one last one is... Uh... You Mise en bataille au château, yeah. and I'm, that's not that great, but I, I, it's, <laughs> bataille is a very hard word to say. <laughs> and that just means that it was bottled at the château. Um, and that means that when you have that situation, that means it was grown there, and then it was uh, produced there and bottled. Uh, and so it just means that a little bit more care went into that wine. Somebody had a vision more times than not. And so when you see that in the bottle, that to me is thumbs up. Let's go. Um, all right, and then so if you're exploring wine from that has this Bordeaux essence, the Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, Cabernet Franc, you could stick around the Virginia region. Um, so we really are focused on our Cabernet Franc, and it's doing really wonderful things around here. Oh my gosh, and yes. It yeah. is worth keeping an eye on. I uh, 
Virginia Maybe. is um, often referred to as the France of the United States or the Europe of the United States. It has a maritime climate, which Bordeaux has a maritime climate. We have clay soils. Bordeaux has clay soils. So um, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and to some extent Cabernet Sauvignon are doing really well here. And Bordeaux blends that are Cabernet Franc heavy are doing just, they're doing amazing things. So uh, keep an eye out on this up and coming region. Ooh -wee. It's a good time to be in Virginia. <laughs> we opened up a bottle to compare with our Bordeaux right bank. Um, the other day, we opened up a Merlot dominant um, blend from Virginia, early Mountain. from Early Mountain. And we were really pleased with the differences and the similarities. Um, you know, I will say that the Virginia produced, it was a bit more fruit forward, but it still had a really lovely herbal earthy note. Um, as compared with some expressions of Merlot from Mediterranean climates, which are much fruitier, much, mm -hmm. much different. It seemed like a, a nice middle point between um, that herbaceousness that we get out of the Bordeaux and then the really fruity notes that we have from other regions, for sure. Again, one of the major takeaways for this evening, if you walk away with nothing else, is that left bank is Cabernet Sauvignon and right bank is Merlot dominant for the Bordeaux region. And crew means growth, so that's not necessarily a reason to buy wine. <laughs> 2016, however, is a reason Ooh. to consider one. <laughs> so thank you for tuning in. Oh, I have some fun facts. Okay, we'll say the fun facts. Did we want some fun facts we want some before fun, we sign off? Let's do some fun okay. facts. So we were in Napa last month. Um, just to give you a sense of size scale, Bordeaux is six times the size of Napa, and it's about seven times the District of Columbia. So this is a massive wine region by comparison to, to a many other famous wine regions, much bigger than Burgundy, much bigger than Napa. Um, as we mentioned, Bordeaux, the city, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but so is Saint-Emilion. So Saint-Emilion has become um, such, a, such a part of the culture of so France and Europe and the world that they have named it a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Okay, some number facts that are fun. <laughs> In 2020, Bordeaux made 580 million bottles of wine, which is equivalent to 174 Olympic-sized pools of wine. So this is, this is a significant amount of wine that they're producing. Not all of it is created equal. <laughs> um, and another fun fact. That's a little numbery. Okay. In 19, the, uh, I'm sorry. In 2010, the most expensive bottle of Bordeaux sold. It was a 1947 Chateau Cheval Blanc, and it sold for $300,000. That's an expensive bottle of wine. I wonder if they actually drank it. I hope they did. And I hope it was <laughs> worth every penny of that amount. <laughs> Well, everybody, it's been fun telling you what we know of the Bordeaux region, scratching the surface in some areas and really diving deeper in, in, in others. We hope that you remember the 2016 vintage, and we hope that you enjoyed your time here this evening. Thank you for tuning in. Cheers. Cheers. All right, like and subscribe. We're ending the YouTube stream, and we'll talk to everybody on the live. Yay. Is it done? I think so. All right, so for those of you in the Zoom, we are just gonna triple check that we are done with the YouTube stream. Definitely didn't do that one time and